Welcome to this third lecture on bug advocacy. So far, we've considered how to write bug reports that encourage programmers and project managers to fix bugs. Today, we're going to consider ways to overcome people's excuses for not fixing bugs. There are lots of excuses for not fixing bugs. In many companies, the most significant one is non-reproducibility. If a programmer can't get the program to fail in the way that was reported, how can she possibly figure out what was wrong and how to fix it? Some companies tell their testers not to report irreproducible bugs. I think that's a big mistake. When I was a maintenance programmer, I could fix about 20% of the hard to reproduce bugs that came across my desk. 20% isn't great, but it's 20% better than the zero you get if you don't report the bugs in the first place. Friends of mine are better at maintenance, and some of them claim to be able to fix 40 or even 50% of the hard to reproduce bugs that they get. It's probably because they build in better troubleshooting support into their code. I found that it always helped me to have several different descriptions, several bug reports for the same intermittent failure. Most hard to reproduce bugs are actually intermittent. They fail time after time, but unpredictably. You don't know how to control a failure. And it would help to have several reports every time somebody saw that failure, a complete report of what they saw, along with a description that says this is hard to reproduce, and oh, by the way, this looks like this other bug with a cross-reference to that other report. I prefer to see these instead of getting just a few comments tacked into the original report. Because when you write a fresh report, first you include all your configuration information. And that might be relevant. Second, you do the whole analysis, start to finish, of everything you did. It's not just one little paragraph on another report. We're missing something. And so the more details we get about what happened, the more things we can rule out as relevant factors. Some testers get a reputation for being sloppy or lazy because they don't do troubleshooting before they report hard to reproduce bugs. Programmers are likely to bounce reports from those testers right back, refusing to even think about them until the tester basically does their own job. When you report a non-reproducible bug, provide detail in that report that lets the programmer know that you really did spend time on this, you really did try reasonable troubleshooting tactics, and this is the stuff you did in case it'll be helpful. Many bug tracking systems have a field, a question on the bug report form that asks, can you reproduce this problem? It's important to use it. It avoids annoying misunderstandings. I want you to imagine yourself in the shoes of the programmer. You read this report that just says, do this, and you see that failure. So you do this, but you don't see the failure. You try it again, doesn't work. Then you start rereading the report more carefully and maybe trying the test on other machines, and eventually you call the tester. And that's when you find out the tester can't reproduce the bug either? Well, that was an annoying waste of time. When a program fails, there's all sorts of information on the computer that you were testing with. If there's any chance that this bug could be hard to reproduce, stop using the computer until you reproduce that bug on another machine. If you preserve the state of your machine, then when you later discover that this bug really is not reproducible, you're in a position to call the program and say, hey, I've got a non-reproducible failure, and I've got a machine that just had that failure. You want to come over and look? Maybe they come over physically, or maybe they walk you through steps that you take and then send information back to them. So you retest on a second machine. If you can't reproduce the bug, what's next? When I hit this point, I immediately start writing everything down, anything that I can think of that might help me go back and think about how to retest. If I'm testing a program that often fails irreproducibly, I probably do most of this writing as soon as I find the bug, even before I try to replicate it, because then my memory is fresher, probably more detailed and more accurate than it will be even 10 minutes later. There's a style of testing called scripted testing, in which you attempt to fully document your tests. The idea is that for every test, you write down the test setup. You include the data values, a step-by-step -step description, and the expected results for the test. This is often considered very good practice, but it's not free. It takes a lot of time to write a script that is precise enough for someone else to use it accurately. Now, some people insist that testing without scripts is one of the primary causes of irreproducible bugs. It is true that if you don't pay attention to what you're doing, you can run into a bug with no idea what you did to reach it. I've had that happen, especially when I'm really tired. It's a signal to me that I should go to bed. But most of the time, when I find a bug, I have a really clear idea of what I did, and I can usually do it again. Some people also claim that people who test with scripts rarely run into hard-to-reproduce bugs. And that might be true, but I think it's not for the reason that first comes to mind. 
Once you have a script, you're likely to use that scripted test over and over again. We call that regression testing. And the people who like scripts really think regression testing is a great practice. But the way I see it, when you run a test, the program might pass it or fail it. But after a few uses of the test, you found the bug that test was looking for. Eventually, you have this pool of scripted tests, and they all have one thing in common. The program has passed every one of these tests many times. When you run a new version of the program against these tests, if you've got a bunch of them, it'll probably fail a few. But if you ran new tests instead, in my experience, the experience of several colleagues, it would probably fail more if they were well-designed tests. So yeah, if you're using scripted tests, you might not find very many bugs. And if you don't find very many bugs, you won't find very many irreproducible ones. But I'm not sure that's a big benefit. I do get hard to reproduce bugs. But a lot of those would be hard to reproduce whether I was following a script or not, because you can't put every possible piece of information into the script. To understand why that is, let's review Doug Hoffman's diagram, which we studied with test oracles. In this diagram, the script would describe all of the intended inputs, including the intended configuration and the intended program state. But there are a lot of details this description won't cover. When you run a test, do you check how much disk space is free? How fragmented your computer's memory is? How hot the CPU chip is in your computer? How recently your system was updated? What memory resident programs are running on your computer? On a Windows system, run Task Manager sometime. There are probably 40 to 60 programs running. Does your script list all of these and their update versions? Do you even know how to find out when each of these was last updated? Does your script specify how quickly you should type or exactly where to put your mouse pointer on the screen when you start moving to click something? Does it specify what parts of the screen you'll move over on your way to that next menu choice? Every one of these variables has been involved in at least one hard to reproduce failure that I've seen, and not one of them would have been specified in most test scripts. Hoffman's diagram also identifies monitored outputs of a test. On a script, these would be the expected results. But many failures involve outputs that the script didn't consider. If the program adds 2 plus 3 and gets the expected result of 5, that's great. But if it took two hours to get that result, that's a failure. What if it sent messages about what you were doing to another computer? What if it added unnecessary data to the stack, or overwrote part of memory, or erased a file on disk, or interrupted a data stream to the printer? All of these things are fully compatible with getting the expected result of 5, and all of them are unacceptable. We can't monitor every imaginable outcome. We can't monitor every imaginable result of a test. But I've seen unexpected program failures that involved unexpected, unmonitored results. If you're not expecting them, when you finally notice them, it can be hard to reproduce them. The challenge of an irreproducible bug is that it includes a test condition that I have not imagined would be relevant. So I don't know how to usefully control it. For example, if the critical condition involves a variable I wasn't thinking about, I don't know what value it had, so I don't know what values to try, even if I do include that variable when I try to reproduce the test. Now, there are plenty of tools that can help you capture additional information about the system and what you're doing in a test. This list is just to start. There are plenty of websites that have links to test tools. If you think you're having a problem with reproducibility of bugs, you want to start adding tools. Note that I'm not listing here the widely used capture replay GUI regression tools. A lot of people say these are great for making bugs reproducible, but other people tell me that their experience hasn't been so good. I'm not going to make any recommendations. You'll have to explore this one yourself. A few years ago, I got to talk with Watts Humphrey about testing. Watts made the observation that programmers make characteristic errors. That is, one person usually makes some types of mistakes, and another person makes other types of mistakes. By tracking their own mistakes, programmers could learn to recognize their characteristic errors. Once they did, they'd stop making them. Watts suggested to me that we should think of non-reproducible bugs as tester mistakes, the same way as we've got programmer mistakes. If a non-reproducible bug reflects a blind spot in your thinking, and if you can learn what the critical condition would have been to replicate a bug that you couldn't replicate, you could track that. Eventually, this can give you a sense of what conditions you've been missing that tend to be relevant to this company on this platform. So the next several slides give examples of conditions that colleagues and I have missed in our testing that turned out to be critical for some bugs. This list is way out of date. It'll miss many of the conditions that are probably relevant to you in your application on your platform, but perhaps it'll give you some ideas when you're trying to make a bug reproducible. 
If you find this useful as a starting list of ideas, I strongly suggest that you make one of your own. When a programmer fixes a bug, ask her how you could have triggered that bug in the build of the software you tested. And then try it. Bring up that build and try to reproduce the bug now. If you can, you now understand what the critical condition was that you missed. Write it down. Keep track of how often you miss that condition in the future. If it's a significant condition, eventually you're going to stop missing it. There's a long list of examples. You can go through most of them on your own. I'll give one example to give you a feel for the list. The example is the delayed effect bug. What distinguishes a delayed effect bug is that the failure happens, but you don't notice it. Later, maybe hours or days later, there's a more visible consequence of that failure, and that's what you notice. Here's a simple example of a delayed effect bug, a memory leak. Suppose you test a paint program. When you draw a circle, the program uses memory. When you erase the circle, maybe the program is supposed to release that memory back to the operating system. If it doesn't, you have a memory leak. If you draw a circle, erase the circle, draw the circle, erase the circle, draw the circle, erase the circle. Every time you draw the circle, the program uses more memory. Eventually, you're going to run out of memory, even though you've only got one circle on the screen. Imagine running a sequence of tests where you do lots of circle-related testing. You try different size circles and different colors and different fills. You don't see any bugs, so eventually you say, OK, I'm done with circles. Now it's time to test something else. So you put a text box on the screen, and it crashes immediately with an out-of-memory error. Well, your first intuition might be that text boxes are really badly broken. But as you test and retest on text boxes, you're not going to find anything. What you have to do is to think backwards in time. What was I doing before I was working with text boxes? Then you'll go, oh, it's a long sequence with circles. And that's where you find the memory leak. So the rest of these slides list more ideas. I'm not going to describe all the ideas one by one. You can read them yourself. Here's another set. On we go. Here's another set. Here's another set. Here's another set. It's another set. It's another set. So you go through all your ideas, and you still can't make the bug reproducible. When should you close it as just no one can reproduce this bug? We're done with it. Non-reproducible bugs are hard to troubleshoot, but it's often much easier to troubleshoot them when there are multiple reports of the same failure, because each report offers different information. Because of this, many development groups keep all of their non-reproducible bugs open in the bug tracking system. Now, this causes a problem at some companies because they have managers who really rely on bug statistics, like how many bugs are open. They want to compute how long it takes on average before their programmers fix a bug. And if you keep the non-reproducible bugs open, it inflates the open bug count, and it really hurts the statistics on programmer productivity. So that at companies that rely heavily on these statistics, there is enormous pressure to close non-reproducible bugs right away. But that means a lot of hard-to-reproduce bugs that could have been fixed won't be fixed because we don't have these useful multiple reports open to see. I used to try to argue with managers and executives and especially uh, independent quality assurance groups that relying on bug counts wasn't necessarily the most useful thing to do. I've given up on that. Instead, I've added a new resolution to bug tracking systems that I work with. In the typical bug tracking system, a bug status is open or closed. Closed bugs you never look at again, they're history. The resolution indicates what happened to the bug, like fixed or deferred. In companies that rely on bug statistics, I close non-reproducible bugs, but I assign them a resolution code that I call dumpster. This keeps the open bug count as low as if I had permanently closed, thrown away the non-reproducible bugs. But if I search for resolution codes of dumpster, I can easily find all of the closed, not reproducible bugs. The reason that I do this is that it makes it easy to go dumpster diving. Every week, imagine a tester and a programmer searching the database for dumpster bugs. What they're looking for are similarities. If they find a lot of reports that seem to be about basically the same bug, they can isolate those. They can say, let's work on these 10 failures this week. If they find the underlying problem from all of these different angles on what this problem looks like, then the bug can get fixed or deferred or whatever. And the resolution, of course, gets updated appropriately. If they still can't reproduce the bug, they can add their troubleshooting notes to one of the reports, and then they can leave these reports in the dumpster. They can try again much later.
Keeping all the reports of similar failures makes handling of non-reproducible bugs more efficient and more effective. Hiding them in the dumpster keeps the bureaucrats happy because it lets their numbers look good. Of course, some bureaucrats would get very grumpy if you ever explain the dumpster system to them. Because what you're really doing is keeping some closed bugs open. They would interpret that as manipulating their numbers, which of course is exactly what you're doing. You're working around their system in order to keep reports available that would otherwise be closed and discarded. Sometimes it's better to do the right thing than it is to tell people what you're doing. Let's review today's work. Our goal is to write reports well enough to make sure that the bug deferrals and bug rejections are based on the bug, not on the quality of the reporting. Failures that are genuinely non-reproducible can't be fixed. If you can't find the problem, you can't create a solution. But most failures are not genuinely non-reproducible, they're just hard. They could be reproduced if we only knew what the critical conditions were. But unfortunately, nobody can pay attention to all of the possible conditions, all of the possible outcomes of any test. So sometimes a failure happens under circumstances that we basically didn't notice. There are lots of tools that can help capture this information. My opinion, these are cheaper and probably more effective than writing out and following detailed test scripts. Keeping track of the critical conditions that you missed will help you imagine conditions that are interestingly relevant next time. Final point, there's a lot of value in writing a hard to reproduce bug up every time you see it. Make sure you include enough detail to make your report worth reading. Cross-reference your reports in a way that makes it clear that your goal is providing data, not padding the number of bugs reporting statistics. In companies that really worry about bug statistics, you might deal with the second and later reports of a hard to reproduce bug by making them comments on the initial report. This will keep the bug count down, but you're gonna have to pay extra attention to writing in all the potentially relevant conditions that are automatically captured, like configuration information, if you were entering a full bug report.